because you're now looking at the bottom of the stairs. And you see this decoration, carved wooden uh, newel posts there, inlaid decoration around the fireplace. And then a light well that goes up here with more carved woodwork, or does one call that carved, this cut through woodwork. And it is again very organic, very much to do with natural plant form. But what I find so fascinating about this is that you come in through the door here to a tall space, and just above that area there on the plan, there's this light shaft that goes all the way up. But you go into the stairs through an arch, up, past and over another arch, and you're sort of moving transversely through the, the thickness of the wall almost to, to move to the upper floor. As you stand on the bottom of the stairs, you might look back into that room there, the main dining room here. We know it's the dining room because there's the uh, butler's pantry and the stairs down to the kitchen. There's an alcove in here, which is that thing in there. And there's the decorated mule post, as I say, at the bottom of the stairs here. But look up and up. And as you go up one floor, onto the first floor landing, or the Americans call it the second floor landing. They always seem to get that muddled. There's this amazing screen here made of timber that, or pieces of wood that taper to a point at the top. It is extraordinary, it's exquisite. And behind that is the stairs, so like a shadow. So somebody could be going up there and you just get this fleeting impression of them moving up the stairs to the bedroom level, of course, or the, the guest bedroom level, the main bedroom level is, is on this floor here. It is really the most extraordinary interior space. On the main bedroom level, the first floor, you can come out onto the balcony, up here from the, from the main bedroom in there. And that extraordinary stairs takes you up there to the, the attic level, up here. more shots of the balcony. The same Wainwrights, um, now they're starting to die off and they needed a tomb. So Sullivan built a tomb in St. Louis, Missouri for that rich family. And it is a simple box, if you like. It's got a dome on the top. It could be traced back to, um, in a many sort of classical uh, funerary buildings or chapel forms. But what I gain, I want you to notice, is this decoration that runs around here, this band of organic decorative stonework. And how symmetrical it is and how formal it is. Up three steps, by three steps, the Trinity, perhaps, if you're a Christian, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you get three steps frequently in Christian buildings. And then on central axis, you get these uh, bronze doors with this decorative stonework around and a dome over the central space. And we find this, this arrangement appearing again and again, not just in his architecture, but also in Frank Lloyd Wright's. That is the side of the tomb, that side there, there's the front we've just seen. You get the same arrangement here, and the same arrangement here. Okay, windows have been inserted into there and there, if you like, but this is the same way of dealing with a, an entrance or an elevation into completely different types of buildings. And it was the same arrangement that Frank Lloyd Wright used in the Winslow House, which was um, pretty much the first building he did on his own after he left working for Lewis Sullivan. Frank Lloyd Wright, a man of many lives, a man of many wives, um, a man who kept changing his date of birth. He was born in 1867. He liked to say it was 1869, but I've seen a picture of his passport when he went to Japan in 1905 and said 1867. Um, a man of many careers. We're going to go through Frank Lloyd Wright fairly quickly. Because I'm sure you've seen, I would hope you've seen, work by Frank Lloyd Wright before, but Henry Hobson Richardson, you probably haven't, and Lewis Sullivan, you probably haven't. 
But they're the basis of this man's architecture. Without them, I don't think he would have been who he was. He would have said he would have been who he was. He knew it all intuitively. Learned it from his mother and using uh, Kroibel blocks, which were wooden blocks that you could make things with. But um, a man of great confidence. And he wasn't very tall. He was about five foot six or something. It was that big in meters. 1.6. He was down here somewhere. Small men have big egos. So he is very much um, a man of himself, as it were. We've got various pictures of him today. Um, that's 1895. So he's about 30 there. And he just built this house. And I think this is one of his most wonderful buildings, just because it's so pristine and so neat. And I had a fabulous day in Chicago back in 19... <clears throat> 89, before you were born. And I went out to River Forest and Oak Park. This is River Forest. Oak Park is just down the road. And it's full of his buildings because he lived there. And I got there in the morning. It was a beautiful sunny day. And I walked all the way west. And all the buildings got the morning sun on them. And then I got down to that here and turned around and went all the way back. And I got the afternoon sun on them. I mean, it was really a wonderful time. And if you, um, if you can do that when you're looking at buildings, it makes it so much more enjoyable. How many times have I told you to look at buildings today? That's what you've got to do. You've got to get out there, look at the sky. So what does I make of this? This is a very formal, very symmetrical building. A quick word of warning. Um, this bit up here is the roof of that bit over there. That bit is there, it's a stable block. You go through this arch here, you get, there we are, you go through there, get the, the stable block, but that isn't there physically, it is over here. So what you really see is this, and it's open landscape down the side. And, you know, there's that building. Axis right down the middle, there. And the focal point of the axis is the fireplace here, because that's where the heart is, and the home is where the heart is. Heart, heart, home, however you want to interpret it, that's the focal point of the house. And that's what you see as you go in, another arch here, and you know, there is the focal point. And around the fireplace is the stairs. So very often, the language of a Grand Valley Grand House is a T-shaped plan, which is pretty much what you've got here, with uh, the fireplace in the middle, and you know it's in the middle because you can see it up there, there's the chimney, and you have this great big roof. The roof is held down visually by the chimney, like a big nail going through the roof of the chimney to force it down. The chimney is sticking out, the, sorry, the roof is sticking out to the side like an umbrella. And this bit here, the first floor, bedroom level, is dark, which makes it disappear. What you really read is the bright brick work here, the white stone, and then the heavy roof on top. It seems to almost float, but we know it doesn't float because it's got the great big nail of the chimney holding it down. This is a building that is part of the landscape. It spreads out horizontally. This is Frank Lloyd Wright. This is organic architecture. There's the arrangement. You go in through the door. You get the hallway. You get the fireplace you get the stairs. And then forming the T, on the one side you've got the living, on the other side you've got the library. And this, this arrangement is repeated time and again in his buildings. To the side of this you get the archway that goes through to the, the stable yard that I showed you before, but just as a quick aid memoir, look how Lewis Sullivan that is, Sullivan-esque on either side. That is still um, the influence of Sullivan coming through. Wright had left Sullivan after a big row because he was moonlighting. He was doing work privately while being employed by Sullivan. Sullivan, in a sense, quite rightly got a bit cheesed off with this and said, you can't do that. And Wright said, yes, I can, because I'm leaving. And he walked out. But he always maintained a great affection and um, appreciation for Lewis Sullivan, who he called mein Liebermeister, my dear master. 
This way of reading a building, of looking at it, trying to understand what it's, it's doing and what it's saying, I think is, is quite exquisite in this building here. The Moore House, uh, Oak Park, just down the road from the Windsor House. Looking very, very different. You might say, oh, that looks like a Tudor cottage from the Cotswolds, you know, medieval England. Well, it sort of does, but it sort of doesn't. Because what you actually get here is an expression of organic architecture, a building that is part of the landscape, which is admittedly very flat here, but one that has a great horizontal emphasis at sort of every level, down here, up here. The eaves are coming very low down. And wherever there's a, a vertical thrust, there's this great capping roof that comes over to enshroud it like an overcoat, like a hood, like an umbrella. And these great big chimneys nailing it to the ground there. The building's allowed to spread out, but it's trying to go up, but it's not really allowed to because of the, the force of this, this enshrouding roof. The, the details of that might again be thought to be sort of late medieval, but don't, don't be so sort of misled by that. Okay, that looks, you know, England 1600-ish, 1580. But that's not really the point. The point is the idea of a, um, a building that is at one with the ground, that is part of this, this organic tradition that Frank Rodrack was really promoting. And bearing in mind that around Chicago, the ground is extremely flat, the prairies, there's not a lot of hills around there. Um, this is very much an architecture that fits in there. He built his own house um, with various additions in Oak Park. He built the Cheney House um, at the bottom there. He did about 30 houses around here. There's, there's a lot of them. But uh, the Cheney House, you can look at, could have had a, a story to it. That's his house. It had, as I say, additions. That's the dining room that was added on. But look at the way this, this big gable end here overhangs and in shadows that area below with a little bit of classical detailing in there. He'd been to Japan in um, 1905 and he was certainly aware of Japanese architecture before he went. And one might argue that this is um, a Japanese form, a big, big roof, a minka, Japanese farmhouse, a minka roof form with the open wall underneath. In this case, lost in shadow, Japanese houses have walls you can take away and just support them in the post. And here again is, is that idea, horizontal walling, um, enshrouding the site, enclosing the site, and then a big, big roof, but between the two, a layer of windows. And this was built uh, for his client, the Chaney's. Um, Mar Chaney will come back into the story. But as we look at these buildings, we go through um, Oak Park and you know, just get a feel for what he was doing. And they're, they're on every corner, they're on every block. You get three of them in a row. And it's really quite wonderful. You get, again, this great sense of horizontality. Where there's a vertical form, it is compressed by the, the great roof, the horizontal. The horizontal banding of windows, horizontal emphasis, the window source of the um, roof eaves, of the banding in the facade, and the banding on the parapet wall, sometimes a wall, sometimes a band that goes through the building. And the same in Buffalo, um, the Darwin D. Martin House. This looks particularly naked at the moment, and um, unfortunately I couldn't get pictures inside that wasn't allowed, but I hope you can see again how the building reaches out over its landscape. The roof coming out here from the entrance hallway over creating what we call a port crochet, a driveway through to the garaging at the back. How the horizontals are now done in stone in these buildings and the bricks below are Roman bricks and I'll mention those in a minute. The dark windows under the eaves, the overhanging roof there shadowing them. You might say there's so much shadow in this building, it must be gloomy. Well it was very cold and gloomy day but in the summer the weather is much better and it is really quite hot in these places. And there's a number of little buildings on this site. There's the gardener's building, the garage, the mother-in-law's building, and the main house. 
And in, in it all, you get this richness of decoration, but as in the windows here, as in the light fittings there, um, but also an extraordinary emphasis on the horizontal. Just look at that horizontal banding in the brickwork. I'll come back to that in a minute. And you can see it there. What, what they've done, and I've got more examples of this, is raked out, using a trowel, raked out the horizontal mortar between the bricks to create shadow. And then using a mortar that is the same color as the bricks, done flush mortaring there and there and there and there and there. So you don't see the vertical lines, really, between the bricks. So you just get horizontal, horizontal, horizontal emphasis. And that's really what this building is about. This is the, the Roby House, maybe the most famous house in um, Chicago, second only perhaps to Falling Water, which is, of course, not in Chicago. The same day that I took all those pictures in Oak Park and in River Forest for the same weekend, I, I came down here. I've got a bus down. I was at a conference in Chicago. I somehow got down to South Chicago, where this building is. And I've never seen it before. It's fantastic. Let's go and have a look. And I, I walked up to it, and I was standing about here somewhere. And suddenly, over this parapet, appeared a familiar face. Bearing in mind, I was teaching in California at the time, which was about 2,000 miles away. This guy said, oh, it's Professor Jackson. I thought, Jesus, I can't get away from these people. So, you know, my students got there before me, and I didn't even know they were going to be there. But it's great. You know, you look at this building, and you think, you know, this is worth traveling on a red-eye all-night flight to see in weather like this in the winter, because there aren't so many leaves on the trees. And uh, I had a fantastic few, oh, about an hour here, I guess, and then I had to get back to the conference. And I went and asked these two ladies, two sort of elderly ladies, excuse me, ma'am, I said, um, where can I get a bus back to downtown? <gasps> you can't do that from around here. Oh, the park is dangerous. Quick, get in the car, we'll drive you. So they sucked me in the car and drove me all the way back to the town centre, which was sort of rather nice of them. And, um, you know, when you're a foreigner, you do things that are crazy, but um, sometimes it pays off. So here we have the, the Roby house, built for a man who made bicycles. And I put these two together like this, really to emphasize the horizontal layering. But when you look at the plan, you can see how broad the rooms are. This is the main living floor, which is that level up there, that level down here. And you can see this vast room from the dining at this end to the living at that end, and the fireplace in the middle held down by the chimney, the roof's held down by the chimney, going down to the fireplace, and the stairs wrapping up beside the fireplace. Servants wing out the back. You don't worry about that. You can't even find your way into this building. This is one of the weird things about it. You have to go down a... Stairs again. You have to go down a ramp. Whoops. Come back. You have to go down a ramp at the back here and enter, enter down here. But um, this is the the great horizontal building in terms of Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture. This is an example of that stonework, this is an earlier photograph, but you can see here how well it works. And then you can look at this bit of the building where they've restored it, or indeed look at that bit up there, and they've got it all wrong. You know, these are the raked horizontal joints with the perpens, the vertical joints, flush mortared so you don't see them, and that's exactly how you should not do it. So whoever restored the building at that time um, got it completely wrong. And where does it come from? It comes from Roman brickwork. And um, she used the baths of Caracalla in Rome. It's quite hard to find a bit of original Roman brickwork in a Roman building, right? but then it's 2,000 years old. So there's the Roman brickwork. And you can see that the proportions of the bricks are long and thin, long and thin bricks. So that already gives you this, this sense of horizontality. So I just put this in to show that a Roman brick in Rome is a real thing. These are later um, skins of brickwork. I can't tell you what shape that is. But that's what the baths of Caracalla look like now. They weren't designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, by the way, if you were thinking. So we come back here to the great hallway, living room on the, on the first floor there. Top right photograph taken from about there, looking towards the fireplace, 
and these windows all the way down the side, which can all open up, making the roof appear to float above the um, floor. Top left photograph taken from over here, looking that way, with the low ceiling beams. But when you walk down the side here, the ceiling actually gets even lower, forcing you down towards the ground. 1906, he'd just been to Japan, 1905 Japan, and he has, in a way, picked up on this idea of the Japanese house, which is the roof and the floor and the thin posts in between. And I think it's quite, quite clear in this building. So we move into another phase of that. Why, why do we do this? Because he disappeared off to Berlin with one of his clients from wife, Mrs. Charmley, um, who showed you the Charmley house. So um, you don't really do that when you're a small town architect, or an architect from a small town, you know, parts, and your clients live all the way around you. You don't take their wife and go off to Berlin. But he went to Berlin, and he published a great folio of his drawings um, called Alfred Goethe Balkan with Enver von Frankstoy's right. Patrick speaks German, he'll explain to you what that means. But it's French, what does it mean? Um, completed works and what was the Alfred Goethe Balkan und Enver and drawing. Completed works and drawings by Frank Lloyd Wright, published in 1910, second edition 1911. And it was his statement this is what I've done. And then it sort of all went quiet. His career, in a way, was over. So he went out to California and started building there. He wasn't appreciated very much in and around Chicago. California, a couple of thousand miles away, different weather, different climate, different conditions, different traditions. And he built for Alien Barnsall this house, the Hollyhock House, on top of a hill in Los Angeles. Completely different ideas. This is referencing Central American architecture, Mesoamerican architecture, the Maya, the Inca, the Aztec, whichever you want. But, you know, it's a different type of building. There's the Griffith Park Observatory, if you know anything about Los Angeles. There is the Hollywood sign on the hill. There is the courtyard in the center of the Hollyhock House. And this is where I live. Not in there, not in the building. I live in Los Angeles. And we would have our student end of year parties in this house and other famous buildings. It was all rather fun. And well, anyway, this was on one such occasion, I guess. I somehow got onto this, this roof terrace. Los Angeles has a big problem with earthquakes. So you can't do brick buildings very well. You have to do reinforced concrete buildings, such as this. This is actually very much timber frame. You do timber frame or reinforced concrete. Those are about your only choices in Los Angeles. Otherwise, you get your building falling down in an earthquake. But in here, there's um, fascinating richness, very much in the manner of Lewis Sullivan, but done rather differently, in the sense of richly decorated, but um, now decorated in cast concrete, not in um, terracotta. The Japan influence is still there, and why not? This is very much a sort of Japanese type of room, because Frank Lloyd Wright is now um, in uh, Los Angeles, traveling how many times? Six times across the Pacific to Tokyo, where he was building a hotel, the Imperial Hotel in, in Tokyo. He lived for quite a few months in Japan, nearly two years altogether, and there's a lot of Japanese influence appearing in the work at this time. This is the Barnstall House. That's the inside of the Barnstall House in Los Angeles, which looks quite Japanesey. This is a house he built in Japan, in Ashia. And I think you would agree that this and that could all be the same building. The fact is they're not. They've got the Pacific Ocean between them. But nevertheless, you know, this is, is the sort of architecture he was um, involving himself with in Japan as well as in Los Angeles. It's the Yamamura house, stuck up on a little crest of a hill there, quite difficult to photograph as you can see from down here. And when you get up to the house, you can't get far enough back from it to see very much. Very similar climate conditions, very similar um, seismic conditions, earthquake conditions, to what you have in Los Angeles. So there's no, um, no need to in a way change your architecture. The architecture for Tokyo, the architecture for Los Angeles could be the same. 
We've seen that picture already, and now it's in the context of, of the house. And this bit here is that bit sort of up there at the top. You come up the driveway, left-hand photograph, you come up and go through an archway here on the left and into the building. And he built this with um, a Japanese architect who was his assistant at the Imperial Hotel that he was building in Tokyo at just this time. But I want you to look at this, again, this, this rich decoration. It is very similar to what Sullivan had been doing. This is an Oya, O-Y-A, Oya stone. It's a volcanic stone, and this is smooth concrete. But, you know, it's cut, it is rich, it is exquisite in so many ways, and it is very much the organic tradition that he learned from or developed while with um, Lewis Sullivan. And the building steps up in layers, going back to, up the hill. And at the very top, you get this uh, sort of dining room area up here with this great roof terrace outside. It's really a rather fabulous building. Has anyone been to Japan? Good. Did you go there? Well, next time. It's well worth it. And you go inside, and the interior it is full of the sort of craft work that one does recognize from Frank Lloyd Wright's earlier buildings. His interiors were richly crafted, but now there's something just a little bit different about them. The, the way that this woodwork is done is suggestive of the interiors of Japanese houses. These are absolutely typical bits of Wrightian, right Frank Lloyd Wrightian furniture, his fascination with the hexagon. But, um, you know, this, this sort of stuff is, is not unlike um, interior detailing in Japanese houses. This is the dining room on the top floor, and it disappears up into the roof. And behind the camera is that great long terrace that you've seen. In Los Angeles, he concentrated on concrete work. He built uh, concrete block houses, meaning houses out of concrete blocks, because you build it up in blocks, you put metal reinforcements down the hollow centers of the blocks, you pour in cement, and you end up with a, a solid monolithic wall. And hopefully that will um, not collapse in earthquakes. In Los Angeles, central LA, the Stora House. It's a little bit aggressive, perhaps, you know, you've got to like concrete if you're going to sit inside a concrete environment. But nevertheless, it is highly crafted and highly, highly wrought. And it is very similar in many ways to the hotel he was building in Tokyo. This is a rebuild of the hotel. In Japan, they're always knocking down buildings. And then they rebuild them somewhere else. This huge hotel got knocked down and transported about 200 miles, 280 kilometers, or whatever, out west to a park where they collect pieces of architecture. There's about 80 buildings in the park. And one of the most interesting, from my point of view, is this. This is the entrance bit of the Imperial Hotel. It's just a fraction of the old building. But you know, it is at least there. You can go in and have a cup of coffee and all the rest of it and enjoy some of the ambience of being in one's great um, Imperial Hotel. Obviously, uh, the bus station and things like that are not part of it. But as you go inside, you can see it's the same sort of interior as we saw at the Sora house. The same interest in carved surfaces. Well, this is Oya stone again, or this stuff, whereas the Sora house was done in carved concrete. And these. Um, Again, it's the, the raked horizontal joints, the dark mortar joints, perhaps, but with the verticals more or less disappearing. And the horizontal emphasis is actually um, very, very much emphasized. Look, you see who's over here? Mr. Wright sharpening a pencil, a large photograph. Well, the hotel got finished. He left Japan. There was a vast earthquake, a great Kanto earthquake. In 1923, the hotel somehow survived that because it was floating on a concrete raft. And 
He thought this was a great success. He felt it was his redemption in a way. He then had gone to Japan, he'd gone to California, and he came back and started working again uh, from his original home base in Wisconsin, which is northwest of Chicago, at Taliesin, um, his hilltop family home there. We now jump forward to an older man, an older photograph, I mean, a, photo, a more recent photograph of an older man. But other ideas are coming through. He's still busy, he's still creating. He was asked to build a house um, near Stanford University in California, and he based this all upon the hexagon. It's the honeycomb house, hexagon honeycomb, um, for the Hannah family. And if you look at the plan there, you can see how intricate it is, how rich it is. And the building weaves in and out of the plan, if you like. Sometimes, in a sense, you're inside, sometimes you're outside. You know, where really is the edge of the building in all this? Is it under the eaves? Is it behind the glass? What happens when the windows open? Are you inside? Are you outside? It's an ambiguity that you can trace back very easily to Japanese architecture. <coughs> And when you're on the inside here, the octagons, so the hexagons appear again, hexagonal chairs, hexagonal furniture, hexagonal toilet seat, believe me. And the low ceiling here, which continues all the way through to the dining room. I rather like this. You're in the living room here, the ceiling is of a certain height. You go up the stairs, the ceiling is the same height, therefore you feel compression, therefore you want to sit down, therefore you take your seat at the table. The way the architecture manipulates your building, your, your movement through the building, I think you can see that there. But there were these Europeans who were doing white buildings. They were a nuisance because they're not really organic. They don't, um, you know, they're machine made. Le Corbusier, the house was a machine for living in. Metal windows, white walls. Frank Lloyd Wright was out of step. So what does he do? He takes this idea, and for a big department store owner. Uh, the Kaufman family in Fairway uh, Pittsburgh, he builds this, this house at Bear Run, where they had an estate, where there was a waterfall, they used to take picnics at the waterfall. Um, Mr. Wright, you'd like a house you know, here near the waterfall, so Wright gives them a house on the waterfall, right on top of it. And the story is that Kaufman you know, hadn't got any information from Wright about the new house. What's going on? What's going on? So he phones him up and says, I'm coming out to see you. And it took him, whatever it took, three or four hours to drive to where Wright was, in which time Wright sketched out the whole of the house. And, you know, there it is. It was an idea that was just waiting to be realized. And so it sits above the waterfall. And these plans are slightly difficult to understand, but like in the Ashia house, the Japanese one, it climbs up the hill behind the waterfall there. And it is layer upon layer of house. It clings to the rocks. It is very organic in the sense it seems to just move out of the hillside like the Japanese house in Ashia did. I went there in 19... 84. My daughter was three. And we'd driven all the way from Kansas to God knows where, Boston, Philadelphia, New York. And then we drove all the way back to here. We'd been in the car, it seemed, for a week. And we had a special invitation to see the house. No other people there. We had all the time in the world. And my daughter was allowed to come in. You usually have to leave your children in a compound at the gate. You don't want starting those little children in there. But she came in, and it was incredibly cold because it was this time of year. And you know what little children are like when they're wrapped up in clothes? They're sort of like this. They can't move very well, like the Michelin man. And I was just beside myself, you know, this is so exciting. I'm here at last. And she looked around, and she said, we've been there about two minutes. Daddy, I'm bored. Can we go back to the car? <laughs> How do you educate a three-year-old to look at architecture? Well, anyway, um, that was her beginning. She got quite familiar with Frank Lloyd Wright after that. She believed he had a brother called Frank Lloyd Left. But that's another story. <laughs> so, um, what a fabulous building. You can see in the left-hand picture how it seems to have come out of this, this rock here. Um, yes, it's got 
modern windows, if you like, machine-made windows, white concrete. Just look at that beam here that kicks around to allow a tree to come up through it. The stairs that hangs down over the waterfall that has been washed away more than once. Falling water, falling house. Here are the pictures of the main living room in there. That rock is part of the site. That's a tea kettle, well, it's just a large kettle, a large container. And you swing it up over the fireplace here and light a fire underneath and wait three hours for the water to get warm. But nevertheless, this is a building that is part of the landscape from which it emerges. As you can, I think, see in the way that the stonework around the bedrooms here, Kaufman Jr.'s bedroom, Kaufman parents' bedroom, the main house, I mean the main living room, going down there to the terrace and the waterfall, just seems to emerge out of the hillside. And this window there goes through every floor. You can't really see it in more than one picture, but you can open that window up floor to ceiling on three floors, and it's like a vertical slot cutting through the house, sort of demonstrating that these levels, these platforms are all independent of, of themselves and are just reaching out over the waterfall. And then up the hill he built the, the guest house a couple of years later. The, the lady showing us around wanted us to see how thick the cushion was, the foam rubber, but she'd never pushed it back. It looks slightly odd. So, you know, put your guests up the hill and they have to climb the hill to these layers of horizontal stonework and canopy to get to the house. A building that is really part of its landscape, and this is one of my favorite buildings by him, is in Scottsdale, Arizona, Taliesin West. Taliesin East in Wisconsin was his summer home. Then he built his winter home in the desert at Taliesin West. And I can tell you, in the middle of the summer, this is hot. It's, you know, 42 degrees or something. Um, in the winter, it is much more pleasant. And the building is part, again, of its landscape. Look at the hills up there. Look at the rocks here. Look at the layering. Look at the ziggy-zaggy form. And the, the landscape is the same rough type of landscape, the same um, irregular forms. This is where he had, in both situations, actually, Taliesin East and Wisconsin, Taliesin West, here in Arizona, he had his architecture school. They moved with him. He made them build these buildings. He taught them to be architects by doing it. And I think just looking at these pictures, you'll have to agree that the building just seems to emerge out of its landscape or merge with it. And he invented this stuff called desert concrete. You build a big wooden box, you chuck in some rocks, you throw in a lot of cement, you take the wooden box away, and that's what you've got. You've got a, ah, 